Hi guys and welcome to this episode of the Comedy Defect Podcast. This is episode 36 with a very good friend of mine and comedy mimic, Mr. Stephen Owen Williams. I met Stephen at a lot of gigs. He's a very funny guy. He's brilliant. I just love what he does. Totally different. He's done loads of things. He's been going since 1983. He's been going since then. That's when he did his first gig. First paid professional gig he did in 1983. He's such a lovely guy. I spent an hour and like nearly 20 minutes talking to him about his backstory as well. Because his backstory is even more fascinating. He is a comedy mimic and also a ex, because he's just recently retired, homicide detective. I just wanted to quiz him all about the tricks in the trade and all this kind of stuff. But, you know, it was he explained it all to me that it wasn't really like that. But it's great. You'll hear it all on here. We talked about how Steve does a lot of raffles. Found out, not a big fan of raffles. But it was interesting. I found out a lot about myself during this interview. But, yeah, I enjoyed talking to Steve. It was great. Look, go find him on Facebook. Go follow him on Twitter. And go speak to him if you go see him live. He's a really lovely fella and very funny act as well. If you like this podcast, you can follow us on Twitter. We're there at The Comedy Defect. If you want to follow me, it's at Winter Phonander. If you want to support this podcast, you can find us on Patreon and you can donate as little as a pound or as much as you want. If you can't support us financially, that's fine. Just share your favourite episode. Give us a nice, honest review on iTunes or Podbean or wherever you get your podcasts because that really helps. And those of you that do donate, you're paying for the people that can't. So thank you very much. Now, I'm also hitting that book the Guinness Encyclopedia. I'm rinsing it for as many jokes as I can possibly find. I've got a few. I've had some really good ones recently. Go check them out. And the title for that is Encyclopedic Jokes. And the handle for it is at Guinness Jokes. Go have a look at those there. Share them, like them. Have just a bit of fun. I've also started up another project. So I thought, look, you know, I don't need free time. What am I doing? You only have one life. Who needs sleep? I've started up something with a friend of mine called Phil Alcott called the Bunkai Bunker, where we just mess about. We, we just can have some fun with it. That, just check that out on Facebook. There's a page there. Go like it. You'll see some videos coming up very soon. Because uh, I really just, I just, I know exactly what to do with my time. I'm going to fill it with things. Why not? Why not just put more things on me so I just, I'm crushed under the weight of the stress. It's great. I love it. It's, it really is. It's, I'm really excited about what's going to happen with the Bunkai Bunker. It's really going to be a lot of fun. I mean, I love doing this podcast, but that's going to be equally fun projects as well look anything creative let's just go and do it look why not if you know why not why why wait just do it now but what else has been happening with me i've got my poster finished for my fringe show and the name it's not just for christmas has changed to tolerance that's what it's changed to and i've got a preview for that well it's begun by the time this comes out it was on monday so you'll know about how it went next week yeah, that's all I want to say to you about this episode this week. This is a really good friend of mine, very funny mimic, Mr. Stephen Owen Williams for episode 36. Enjoy. Steve Owen Williams, welcome to the Comedy Defect. How you doing, man? You all right? I'm good, thanks, Winter. Yes, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm a little bit in awe of the shed envy. I've got a bit of shed envy at nearly 50. <laughs> Sheds and solar lighting is a big thing, so um, yeah, I'm enjoying this. Yeah, it's right? lovely, man. I, I do love it. It's, it's my space, my my sanctuary. It really is. You yeah, know, it's very impressive. It, it's it, it's where I come to get gather my thoughts and hide. That's all I do. I hide now. Uh, I, I don't work necessarily. I just hide. That's that's what that's my uh, that's my mission. It, this out here. Yeah, I relate to that now. What's been going on with you? How you just recently retired? Yeah, or retired. 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 I think I think retired is a. Um, it's an interesting word when they use it in the police service sure. because they, they see retirement as you're going to put your feet up. But the reality is for the last 30 years, I've been tied to one profession. So it's almost like the end of a 30-year contract. So that happened January the 29th. So since then, I've just been trying to put some structure back into my life because for 30 years I had a routine, mm. I was organised, yeah. knew what I was doing on a day-by-day basis. Yeah. Sorry, you were a homicide detective, is that yes. right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, what well, yeah, this interesting uh, backstory? Yeah, yeah, it is for sure. That's great. I mean, yeah, I didn't start off as a homicide detective. Okay. But I, you know, you got to spend two years in uniform. Uh, I became a home beat on Chalkwood Estate in Wembley for a few years, which was interesting. You know. mm. And then into the main CID office, and then eventually, in about '97, transferred to what was regarded as the homicide teams. So then I spent, I mean, best part of about 16, 17 years on there. So I got involved in all sorts of things. In between that, I had a, a little spell where I was teaching mm-hmm. subjects as well. 
to some of the newer detectives. And then I, I went back to the homicide teams. And then eventually the commissioner at the time says, right, you're going to rotate, you're going to get a load of guys that mm. need to be rotated. So they've been in one place too long, so we need to share our skills. So I went out to Harrow for a couple of years. Right. And then when the Olympics happened, I went up uh, on an Olympic sort of prisoner handling team. So any crime that was committed in the Olympic kind of footprint, mm. uh, we processed the prisoners. Any madness happen at the Rally Olympics that you can talk about? I think the Olympics as a whole was phenomenally well organised. Mm. When you look at the potential security threat, mm. it, amazingly, it, the majority of it worked like clockwork. Mm-hmm. So when you spoke to the security staff at the stadium, you know they'd say to you, "I'd say, well, you know, you had any problems? All this sort of stuff." They said, "No, no, no. We had somebody complain that there was no toilet paper in one of the toilets the other day, and it was that sort of stuff. You know, it was <laughs> unbelievable, really, because you think it had massive potential yeah. uh, to really, really be a problem. Uh, phenomenally well organised. I mean, it was an amazing event, wasn't it? It yeah. was just incredible. I thought it was going to be a lot more paperwork than that. Yeah, the, just... yeah. The guy. I mean, the guys we, you guys, we dealt with. It was all for silliness, you know. Mm. There was uh, one of the contractors stole a radio at one of the volleyball courts and. You know, it was kind of very low-level sort of crime. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there was a massive kind of presence from our side of things mm-hmm. just to keep things calm, you know. But I think as a whole, London should be very proud of it. It's brilliant. What made you want to be in the police force? It's a funny story, really, because I started doing comedy in... Blimey, I must have been about 16. So you look at about 1983, 1984. Mm-hmm. And I, I'd always loved... People like Freddie Starr, you know, I'd I, I looked at Tommy Cooper, I'd love Tommy Cooper. I'd always liked that sort of slapsticky mm-hmm. type stuff. And I started to discover that I could do kind of impressions of people. I, I used to use it a lot at school, yeah. get out of trouble, you know, just, just cause chaos. <laughs> uh, started to mimic the teachers. Yeah. And then I, a friend of mine, when I went to college, a friend of mine called Dean Limbletto, he became an actor in the end, but uh, Dean said to me, he said, oh, will you be in a college review? So mm-hmm. I said, yeah, I could. Yeah, we could do that, you know. Mm. So I put together a little routine that involved, obviously, some of the teachers that I was taught by. We delivered it, and it, it went very well. It featured in my school report, probably more than my exam results, um, <laughs> which was a bit of an issue for mum and dad. Oh, really? um, and then it kind of went from there, and Dean said to me, he said, look, you really should put together some proper characters. And mm. I started I started looking at that. I can remember buying the stage and television you know, uh, yeah. on a Thursday back then and, yeah. and looking in the back for talent shows, you mm-hmm. know. And then I did I did my first talent show, probably about 84, in wow. Pinnegreen, and then a little social club thing. Yeah. And it, it was funny because all the kind of hooligans that I was at school with had left, not gone to college, and they were all drinking in the Pinnegreen social club. So I walked in as a former kind of prefect and, and house captain, and, and they said, who, who are you? You know, what are you doing down here? Mm-hmm. What were you here for? I said, well, I'm going to stand up and do... So it's comedy, you mm. know, and it's like, well, I hope you're funny, mate, you know, mm. and all this sort of stuff. Yeah, of so it, it was surreal, really, and we, we, we started to have a little bit of success, you know, back then you were competing, there were there were a few guys doing uh, comedy mm. in the talent shows, but you were getting a real mixture, so you'd have singers, magicians, mm. it was a real kind of variety mm. set up, and it was great. I got noticed by an agent called Dawn Jacoby, and Dawn started to give us some work. I did my first professional gig in uh, April 1985. And that's, that's, that's the contract. That's, yeah, that's, book, that's yeah. the yeah. That's the that's it. You, you brought the scrapbook. The, yeah. It's so that, there we go. That's Harrow Borough Football Club. There's the yeah. contract. 27th of April, 1985. Uh, your spot, 15 minutes for 30 quid. Mate. Payable cash on the night. Amazingly, that night I worked with Jeff Stevenson, who is a very good friend of mine now. Yeah. And and Jeff Jeff has been a professional comedian all his life. He was in the original Bugsy Malone. You know, he was in Only Falls and All Series. He's just a fabulous, incredible act. You yeah. know, amazingly talented man. And worked with him and the late Jimmy Marshall, who again at the time were on the comedians. You know, they were yeah. circuit comedians, television comedians. So it, I was very much the apprentice. Both the guys that night were just incredibly inspiring. Mm. You know, and you think, right, okay, and I, and I. I did a few other bits and pieces, and then I got offered a contract. Dawn came round to the house and had a chat with Dad and I, and she said, right, we'd like Stephen to go to uh, Great Yarmouth, you know, and yeah. work for Warner's Holidays. How yeah. are we then? You're like, uh, what? 18. Yeah, great. So, yeah, 17, uh, yeah, 18, because I, I, I hadn't quite finished my A-levels. Mm-hmm. Dad, bless him, you know, he, he entertained the conversation, mm-hmm. and Dawn left, and he went, that's not happening. Oh. She said, we're not doing that, mate. Man. So uh, I said, no, I think you're right. You know, and, and one of the influences on that was when you look at professional comedians back then, mm. 
you know, Jeff and Jimmy were so good. Mm. You know, I watched those guys over, you know, I did 15 minutes. These guys did half an hour. They were like, bang, 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 you know. And I, I said to Dad, I said, I think you're right. You know, I think you, I said, I'm not ready for this. Yeah, yeah. I, I just haven't got the commitment mm. to, you know, how do you get to that level? You know, I just couldn't imagine. Yeah, you can't where, see the, the, no. the path, can you? Because you no. like get there, but you don't like, well, how do I jump, get from this place where I am to there? And there wasn't, yeah. uh, there wasn't really the, the set up to do that. You know, yeah. lots of these little social clubs, mm. but you kind of needed to be in a showcase or yeah. a talent show or you had to have an agent. Otherwise, there was no real kind of open mic mm-hmm. sort of situation going yeah. on. So it was tricky. Uh, you know, I had to have a reality check and mm. say, look, it coincided with me just, I just started to play rugby as well and I really, really, really got, got, got on with that and enjoyed that. A combination of things led to me looking around job-wise uh, when I finished the A-levels. The police service at the time, it was police, army, mm-hmm. ambulance, banks, you know, they were, you know the, the standard sort of career interview mm-hmm. thing. And I thought, hmm, police got a good rugby team. I'll have a look at that. And, yeah. and that's kind of, you know, I was surprised at it in really because yeah. I, I boarded in... Um, 1986, end of the year 1986, and I, I had a little part-time job at Express Dairies in Ryslip. I was one of the youngest people on the two-day selection thing, mm. and the interview was just priceless, because on, on the application form, they go through the application form, and of course I'd been doing comedy two or three years by mm. then. You know, this police officer flicked through my application form and he went, camera artist, <laughs> can you explain what you mean, Mr Williams? <laughs> and I said, well, I, I do impressions of people. Yeah. He said, oh, he said, why do you put that on the application form? So I said, well, it's, you know, it's about you know, communication, mm. confidence, uh, planning, preparation. And, I'm like, and then the other guy on the board, because you sat in that little stall in Paddington Green Police Station, the other guy said to me, um, he said, well, who do you do? So at the time, I'd said, uh, I said, well, I don't know, Frank Spencer. Yeah. So I'm sat there in Paddington Green, and, and the, these two police officers went, go on then. So, uh, you know, and I, so I still, uh, no, <laughs> no, I've got a bit of trouble today. I don't know how the interview's going to go. <laughs> and then they looked at each other and went, do anybody else? Yeah. So we ended up doing Tommy Cooper, yeah. Dave Medna. Yeah. You know, not, not a smile. Totally. You know, it was like the toughest, <laughs> toughest gig you've done. <laughs> and you think, actually, I'm going for quite a serious job here. Yeah. And I'm doing Day Medlin on a stool in Paddington Green. Great. It, it kind of went from there. So I was surprised. I, I was surprised I got in uh, because they talked about the rugby and everything. And they asked me what I wanted to, uh, what I saw myself doing. I said, I probably wouldn't, you know, wouldn't want to work with the traffic guys. You know, I said, I'm a motorist in your face all day. I'm yeah. not really, not really into that. that. If I had a choice, I probably wouldn't do that. I'd find that I'd put myself under pressure. And then as soon as I said the word pressure, this guy said to me, can't you handle pressure as looms? Mm-hmm. You know, I had to sort of say, well... You know, stand-up comedy. Yeah. When you're when you're standing up there in front of five hundred people, you know, in a sort of university college environment, there is no hiding place. Mm-hmm. And I said, that's pressure for me. I said, you know, we've lived to tell the tale. Mm-hmm. And they looked at again. They look at each other, checking their mm-hmm. good answer. Obviously, it's a combination of things. But I I was amazed I got in. You know, and I mm-hmm. remember vividly phoning my mum and dad, yeah. thinking, blimey, what have I just done? You know, and it kind of went from there. So I I stopped doing the comedy completely really yeah. to concentrate on playing rugby and, mm. and being in the police mm. you know it was uh, it was full on doing the shifts and everything was it was busy mm. and there was only I think it was about 97 I'd done a few little bits at leaving speeches and bits and pieces and about 96 97 I was married I got divorced and I had a bit of time on my hands and I bought a copy of the same television and I thought I'll just have a look at this mm-hmm. just have a little look there was, uh, in the back of that, there was a competition up in the Midlands. It was a Land Rover social club, which was a mm. you know, big social club at the time. And Austin Rover were doing these talent shows. I thought, oh, I've got, I've got time on my hands, I'll go and do them. They were phenomenal experiences. Again, you're on with singers and all sorts mm-hmm. of people. Yeah, the Land Rover one was bizarre because I got through the, through the heat, into the quarterfinal, through, the, through that semi-final. Ended up in the final. No way I should have been there as a mimic. It was surreal, you know. Mm. You hold your own with the singers for a, for a, you know yeah. for an evening. We didn't win it, but again, out of that, people started to pick up the interest again. Mm-hmm. I did a contest at the Albany Tavern down in Bexley Heath, uh, and again, you can't, you know, part of the thing with the police is you can't obviously advertise that you are, you can't use the service to 
you know, pave your way in comedy. It's mm. just that's not on, and you know, you, you're not allowed to do that. Simple as that. But because it was all just sporadic, it it needed to be registered properly. And again, you're not, you know, you're not getting paid for it. I did a contest in Bexley Heath, and Gary Bushell was was judging at the mm. TV critic. Ironically, who his son's in the in the police service now. I stood there, and I, you know, they they sort of cast me as a civil servant as such. Mm-hmm. I came, I think I came second in the final of that. And Gary said to me afterwards, he said. He said, I think I know what you do for a living, you know. And it was funny. It was yeah. funny. And then, but from <laughs> that, uh, the guy booked me for a wedding. I got on with Shawadi Wadi. I warmed up mm. for Shawadi Wadi. Mm-hmm. If you remember Shawadi Wadi right. back in the day, yeah. a rock and roll band. I had to register it with the police. Oh. I put all the forms in. Spoke to my boss. Yeah. I spoke to the bigger boss. Wow. And I said, Look, you know, this is this is what I'm doing. Can wow. I do it? Can't I do it? I'm in your hands. Mm-hmm. And they went, No, no, no. It's compatible with. Oh, great. The service. It come, came with a load of rules. So you're yeah. very restricted on material and mm-hmm. things like that, obviously. Of course. But that was it. Registered as a kind of after-dinner speaker stroke entertainer. And that and they enabled me, when I could, to step in and out of the business. Yeah, so great. I've been very kind of sporadic mm-hmm. and, and stepped in and stepped out of the business mm. periodically. But you must get some really different gigs as well, because being a mimic, you can fit into any lineup be a compliment to any any bill really yeah so you must get more gigs that way sometimes people don't know what to do with you if you see right, okay. uh, and with mimicry very much on how you present the mimics you know you're always trying to look for a different way of doing it mm. you know so at, at the time back then i was doing um cast of Alvida's own pet which ironically i've done fairly recently mm. because i looked out and it was a older audience mm. so I, you know and it fitted in with donald trump so we've gone from you yeah, well you know i'm gonna build a wall mm. And I'm going to get these guys to do it, you know. So, and all ah, right, you know, right, lads, right. Let's let's have a look at this wall, you know. Mm-hmm. So we start doing Barry from our leaders, eh? mm-hmm. and people start picking it up. And then you move to like uh, Oz, you know, oh, it's all right for you, Barry. Uh, and and so those voices start to come back again. Mm-hmm. You know, with a little bit of practice, mm-hmm. you'll 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 get them again, you know, because they do they do drift they drift out. So it does give you flexibility, mm-hmm. and it means that as an MC, you can fill time quite nicely. Mm-hmm. You can cross. I mean, I flip between little bits of stand up. But the biggest thing that I'm looking forward to is having the time to write Mm -hmm. because I I slide in on my backside all the time. It makes me very nervous. Mm. It makes it slightly unpredictable from my side. Mm. Hopefully it comes across smoothly to the audiences. But inside, you know, you know what it's like. Mm. Your head's working like 110 miles an hour. Mm. So I could probably take a bit of pressure off myself <laughs> if I'm prepared a bit better. Um, you're not really swinging from one bit to the next. No, no. And I've been, I've, I mean, I've been incredibly lucky. You know, I've yeah. had to fit in, obviously, around the day job and respect that at all times sort of thing. But some of the gigs that I've been asked to do and done yeah. have been you know, phenomenal, really. Yeah. And, and a lot of it is because... I think, you know, if you've got the right attitude, if, you know, I always work with people, if I'm nice to them, hopefully they'll be nice to me. Exactly. And I keep it very simple. Mm-hmm. You know, we just worked on recommendation for the last 30 years. Great. Which caused me a few issues now because I've got to catch up with the technology side mm-hmm. of it. You know, I've got to work out how to operate a camera mm-hmm. and download a video. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a bit behind. But oh, mate, look, it's constantly evolving and changing. Isn't it? You, yeah. can't, you, you know, you've got to constantly keep up with this stuff. I'm fucking Snapchat. I don't know what the point of that is. It's like, oh, the video disappears yeah. after a day. Well, what the fucking point is that? Why yeah. does it disappear? What, was it was not worth doing. Obviously, yeah. a day, 24 hours is all it's worth. Well, yeah. what is the point of having the fucking app? I had something yesterday, a Google Mail or something, and I had to log in, change mm. the details. But my 10-year-old's profile flipped up, and I'm thinking, how is this all linked? I'm trying to get onto YouTube, mm. but all of Owen's videos are coming up. Mm. <laughs> so it's all... I got completely overwhelmed by Stampy and uh, yeah. Minecraft and all yeah, that yeah, stuff, no. which was priceless. No. Do you do voiceovers as well? Yeah, I've done a few. I mean, not many. Again, it, it, until you are a full-time professional, mm. you know, again, that is a, it's a very massively competitive mm. market. Mm. So it's something that we're looking at. You know, I've got, I work closely with a guy called Alex Lowe, who's probably from Watford. Alex and I went to school yes. together. Um, we're good mates. Mm. Lewis McLeod, who's on uh, Newsoids and, and Dead Ringers. Lewis is a... A dear friend of mine. So that opportunity hopefully will arise. You know, it, it, it's about what the customer wants, mm-hmm. whether I have got the range to do it. You know, how long you've got to practice it. Because again, you can study stuff and faff around for months. You know, it took me a long time to get somebody like Morgan Freeman anywhere near suitable for kind of public consumption. So you know, it's yeah, massively compared. I'd like to. I think mm. I think it's it's doable. So break it down for me then with the uh, when you studied Morgan Freeman, 
what was the process you were okay that, I mean you know I don't want you to like just go this is it everyone can do this now but you know yeah. the, the basics you were okay okay watching his videos but what are the things you focus on when you're trying to mimic it's you know? it, I think with all of them uh, it's trying to have a normal conversation in that okay. person's voice you know again it, it's getting to the stage where you just repetition repetition and, and, and again I think a lot of the mimics would say you know you could watch another mimic and take off their impression of an impression but you're much better going to the source and, mm. and working on it and it again what I don't have the time for but we'll, we'll, we'll get into that is getting all the mannerisms the phrases the tones you know it, it, everything kind of tweaked and, and sorted out it's just, it's a bit like, who was I doing? It's like Boris Johnson came out of Michael McIntyre. So I, I kind of played around with McIntyre. So you, you, one minute you're, so it's lovely, great to see you winter this morning. And then you think, right, okay, if I drop that down a bit, can I go, two, pa, 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 yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. so that's, you, you know, and mm. so they're linked. And it, it, I, I, don't know, it's, I don't know whether it's a listening thing or, mm. it, you know, just oh, yeah. just trying to pick up on yeah. stuff. Only tweets. Uh, yeah, I... I mean, I was a big fan of Joe Pasquale, and I, I, I watched him one night, and I can't remember who was on. He toured with another mimic, female mimic, who came out. And she started doing Joe Pasquale, and I thought, that's brilliant. Yeah. I love that voice. And it took me a long time to get Joe, you know. It, mm. it was, um, yeah, tricky. You know, like Keith Lemon, I'm trying to get Keith Lemon mm. desperately. I love Keith yeah, Lemon. Yeah. But I can't, just can't get my head around it. Yeah. No, it's not, you know... it. it it's just not good enough to, mm. to send out there. So you, know, you have to be, you know, I used to try them all out in the family and everything else. Mm-hmm. And, it, you know, Gary Barlow, still work in process. You know, Lewis and I, but we had a chat a while ago about Gary Barlow because he put Gary Barlow in and then Duncan Wisby did uh, Gary Barlow on one of their shows. And, mm. and we were, is there a perfect Gary Barlow mimic mm. out there? You know, it's mm. quite difficult to do properly, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and everybody, all the mimics, the lovely thing about the mimics is that we all do slightly different people. You know, you obviously you've got the standard big ones, but you know, there's not many of us doing Dara Breen, so I'll mm. I'll do Dara Breen, and mm. there's there's a few few doing Harry Redknapp, but yeah. then I'll try and tweak mine to make that mm. more noticeable, and, yeah. and you know, so it, when we get together as mimics, it's it's pretty chaotic. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> yeah, Lewis came. Who to said the, that? <laughs> yeah, Lewis, Lewis came to the retirement do um, yeah. the other week that I had, and. And uh, I decided to, I just did a tiny little bit of Boris. Yeah. And then he fired up. Great. And, you know, so it's, it's like great. the banter is, yeah, is yeah. good, you know. So it's great. It's magic. Well, that's a lot of fun, yeah, for yeah, sure. Magic. With your, with your mimic set, do you, you put it in certain situations? you set up, or do you just like go with the impression would you like to make? How do you do? I think if you can, you know, the key thing is, to, is like I said, to try and present them in a certain way. It's easier said than done sometimes. Like the other night, uh, you've got limited time. You've only got 10, 10 minutes or so. So I put a load of props in a carrying bag. Mm. And I, I said to the audience, I said, right, I'm going to empower you now to take over my act. Mm. I said, this is the lucky, lucky dip of mimicry. Mm. So I've got an audience member just pulls out, you know, they pulled out a wig. Mm-hmm. So I said, okay, right, well, let's, you know, and with the wig goes a hat. Start, I said, start humming the, the American National Anthem. So they, the whole audience, you know, just start. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then we put the gear on and then we go into a Trump and into mm-hmm. a Boris. And then, yeah. right, who wants another game? Right. So then somebody pulled out. They pulled out, I think, uh, I do some stuff about uh, Mrs. Williams and her, and her skin products and things. Mm-hmm. So then I said, right, we're going to flip over to a bit of stand-up now. Mm-hmm. So we do a little bit of that. So it was different. It was good fun. Mm-hmm. I think I, I'd done stuff where we'd put all the, uh, a load of characters in the Big Brother house. Yeah. So you'd have people bickering around stuff and things like that. Mm-hmm. I write some stuff at the moment around Donald Trump mm-hmm. and Morgan Freeman. They're going to appear together very soon. Mm-hmm. So it's still a work in progress. Cool. The Mock the Week stuff goes well. Yeah. You know, when you've got Dara Breen, you've seen that. When yeah. Dara Breen introduces, you know, you can get in McIntyre, Alan Carr, mm-hmm. Flanagan, Milton Jones, mm-hmm. Andy Parsons, you know, mm-hmm. Rod Gill. But, whoever, you, you know, you can play about with it and swap it around. Mm-hmm. But it, it needs, you know, again, it needs tweaking and tweaking and mm. tweaking to mm. keep it going. Um, the footballers, the sports personalities that come in, I mean, Claudio Ranieri was a godsend with Leicester winning the league, you know, mm-hmm. and, and I looked at Claudio and I thought, well, what, what does he actually say? Mm. And what comes across is that he's just a lovely man. He seems like a lovely man. So I wanted that to come out in the mimic. Mm. And, but then also, it was kind of his just constant kind of disbelief that, he was top of the table and I thought right I need to highlight that so when we did Claudio it was uh, well uh, no he's uh, well 
oh, and mm. you do that for a minute, and people you can see people laughing. So then you play on that a little mm. bit more, and then you, you know he dropped in. He said, "Well, he's so crazy. I, I don't know, no, you know." So it, it just builds on that, mm. and then you you can you know swap it around. Jamie Carragher's got a great voice, you know, mm. big big. Uh, kind of broad scouse accent can take control and then but the uh, the, the spin off of that is that you've got Carragher will take over the studio mm. and you've got Gary Neville who's got a lot better bless him um, but Gary's kind of I portrayed Gary as kind of being quite shy and sheepish mm. so it'd be you go nobody wants to be Gary Neville do they? nobody wants to be Gary Neville mm-hmm. and then you'd have I, I am Gary Neville and, and then we <laughs> we do that sort of yeah. stuff and Harry, I mean, Harry, because I'm a QBR fan, yeah. Harry being down there was just magical. And I just loved that, you know, he was one that I really wanted to get. You know, well, you know, we tried, we tried so hard, you know, they, they the lads were great today, you know, great character to do, you know, you fill in, it don't matter who you support, you know, everybody knows Harry, you know, he's tremendous, you know, terrific, you know. So he was, he's a lovely, again, a lovely voice to do. Yeah. But yeah, you've got all these things going on in your head. It's mad. Mm. Yeah, beware the voices, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which voice? Oh, yeah. I'm just getting spread, so i <laughs> All of them. Yeah. All these guys in my head. Yeah. It's mad. I should have probably done a bit better at school. Okay, what voice do you think in? <laughs> what, mm. What's the voice that you think in the most? Do you know I drift in and drift out? Because yeah. I... Is, is there one that always... Got up, like when you're doing a certain thing, is there one that always just pops, like driving a car? Is the one that pops Do you know what? I was changing. Uh, I was changing the water filter mm. on the, on the fridge the other day. Uh, a typical bloke. I thought, right, I'll just cut a corner here. I won't go down to the shed and get my toolbox out. I'll just get a knife out and I'll cut the pipe and it'll be all right. And I'll but I'll isolate the pipe using another knife, uh, not a screwdriver. <laughs> so I've twisted the isolation <laughs> valve. It hasn't quite got to oh, the end. No. <laughs> and I've gone like this, and water oh. is like, going all over the kitchen. <laughs> I got my, <laughs> my wife and my mother-in-law are sat there and she's gone what are you doing and if, because it's a coping strategy yeah. the whole thing yeah. I've gone don't worry it's alright <laughs> don't worry we can get it sorted out so I'll go and get my hammer from the garage yeah. and then, so you fall into whichever's appropriate you know the mimic at the time you fire them out wherever they come in. <laughs> That's like Frank Spencer is the is the, the first aid kit. Oh, oh it, it's, 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 it's it's yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, and it's again again when you when you want to get control of an audience, I tend to default to Ali G or Borat, oh, yeah, right. somebody like that. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's a nice for me, like it. Mm. So you, you you know you 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 get a louder voice yeah. out to just get everybody to. That's it. it doesn't always work. Yeah, it. yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So cool. you you have that. Yeah. kind of flexibility mm-hmm. and then there'll be other mimics where you, you, you want really people to listen so like somebody like Bob Geldof mm-hmm. you know it's kind of like nice to see you here tonight winter mm-hmm. you want people to get the Dublin side of it out you know mm-hmm. so you know you can use them mm-hmm. they're very flexible yeah. I'll say what I asked you before as well Do you, uh, before we, st- we start recording do you remember your first set yes yeah, I do. Yeah, I did. It was probably the college review one uh, was the first kind of structure that I put in. I probably did. It was about five minutes first off, and then I was uh, I came on as different characters mm. doing, you know, Tommy Cooper and stuff like that. Mm. Yeah, back then I probably got I probably got stuff written down. Mm-hmm. Uh, and like I said, I mean, if I if I review those cassette tapes properly, mm. you know, I, I mean, I cringe at some of the some of the stuff that I used to do. Mm. You know, it was just. It, it, I've taken many, many chances, mm-hmm. but it, it seemed to have an appeal for people. You know, it seemed to. I, it, you know, I can remember I did I did that, that testimonial gig for Craig Dowd, and th- that was for me that was the biggest gig I'd ever done. You know, it was uh, four hundred people in the Kensington Garden Hotel. Uh, they were all paying one hundred and seventy pound a ticket. Whoa. You know, it was mm-hmm. a massive, and I, I got that on the back of doing some stuff with wasps. As a Wasp fan, they, they got us involved doing some charity stuff. Did a few, we organised these curry nights for some of the senior players, and it was a bit of a sort of testimony. It was, and it was a bit more affordable for everybody because, mm. you know, some of these corporate events, people, you know, real support, we just can't get near it. It's ridiculous. And then Craig said to me, he said, I'd like you to do my, he said, I've got a gig for you. That's how it came across. Mm-hmm. I said, okay, mate, uh, what do you want? He said, well, there's a website on it. He said, have a look at the website, see what you think. So I log on. It's got Craig Dowd, testimonial, you know. I said, Craig, that's about my league, mate. He said, no, 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 you'll be all right. You'll be all right, you know. Mm. It was just a surreal, 
you know, huge challenge, mm -hmm. huge challenge, because you're doing 15 minutes. And, um, I, I walked into that room, you're just part of the team that's mm -hmm. going on. Uh, yeah. I said to my dad at the time, I said, I can't believe this, you know, I said, I've just picked up the Heineken Cup and the Zurich yeah. Premiership trophy, yeah, and yeah. I've just carried them down the stairs, yeah. polished them a bit and put them there. I said, you're just part of this machine, this mm -hmm. corporate machine that goes on. The toughest part of the night was dealing with some of the people that, that I get introduced to, because immediately they know that you're the comedian, you're like the comedy turn. And, and yeah. somebody said to me, that again, unnerved me a bit. They said, oh, right, I'm looking forward to this. You know, we were at Rob Howley's testimonial last week. They had Rory Bremner on. And you mm. think, <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I, I'm like, late turn tomorrow. And yeah. I'm, 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 I'm going to be taking statements somewhere. And it was yeah. like, and it was very surreal. Mm. Um, but, it, you know, you, you sometimes you need you need nuts of steel with these That's things. And, but ironically, there were some bits in that set that I'd done in my first ever set yeah. as well you know that you know you just know that works everywhere and you've got you know you, you walk out there you've got the current England team and the current New Zealand team in the mm. audience as well I've met Jonah Lomo I've met Martin John all these people were kind of willing you to do well mm -hmm. but you've got to get used to the fact that the reality is probably only 200 people really want to listen to you is there anyone you could you mean you've got such an ear for a voice now and then people kind of go, I could do you in a second, man. Like, like I could just yeah, I could click. Yeah, you're, you're already in. You're already, like you just go right. I've done that. No problem. You know, like, yeah. You know, talk to them. If their person annoys you a bit, it's easier to go. Oh yeah, totally done. Yeah, it's happened a couple of times. Mm. Again, if I if I listen to a heckler and they've just got a certain accent, you know, that might be in the memory bank, and you yeah. can turn that around very very right. quickly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's tricky because again, they drift in and drift out. So, mm. like Gleeksy, we work with Andy Gleeks. Mm -hmm. um, we were there one night and I started doing Gleeksy. I'd never done, never intended to do Gleeksy, but he's got such a lovely accent. Mm -hmm. It just started to roll in. You know, I was MC and he's on and it just started to yeah. come together. Asked me to do it now, I'd have to go away and study it. You know, so yeah, so it, it is, it's in the listening, you mm. know, very much so. I don't, I don't think you'd get heckled that much really, would you? I've had some shockers over the years. Oh. Yeah, I've had some real shockers. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, and yeah. How, you just like, you mimic them or just kind of, what do you do? Um, I think, I think you've got to, you step off the edge when you're dealing with a heckler. Yeah, they can yeah. make or make or break your night. Simple mm -hmm. as that, can't they? I had one bloke. I, I'd done some material about an area in London, and he obviously lived in this area. It wasn't particularly complimentary. He, he's kind of just mouthing at me, you know, you're dead, basically. Getting the old oh. cutthroat sort of thing and all this sort of stuff. I kind of, I, I went for him, and then just said, I said, Look, it's only comedy, mate, you know, and, and tried to kind of soften it a bit. Mm. And then moved on, moved off in a different direction. And then ironically, I picked him out at the bar afterwards. It turned out we we, we support the same football team. So yeah. he became like my friend for life. You mm. know, bought me a drink and everything. Yeah. Uh, you get others. Uh, I was doing the 100 Club with Alex one night. And I was doing Harry Redknapp. And this guy kept, he, he kept shouting out, you're going down, you're going down. So he's obviously talking about QPR and the football team side of things. Mm. And so, you know, I stopped. And I said, listen, fella. I said, you know, what's up? What's up? Mm -hmm. So you keep shouting it out. Mm. He goes, well, I'm just saying you're rubbish. I said, well, you've got 200 people here looking at you now. I said, you're on now. You know, and, he, and, he's kind of, and he's popped yeah. it. And he, yeah. he, he goes, well, I was just saying, I'm just sharing yeah. my opinion. I said, that's great. I said, stop shouting out. Yeah. And I took a real chance. And I, I said to him, I said, who do you support? He went, Charlton. He goes, give yeah. me a I said, Charlton? I said, and you're taking the mickey out of me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. I said, this stuff writes itself. Yeah. And so now you've got like, all the people are laughing at him. That's it. And again, he came rushing up after me. He said, oh, sorry about that. Sorry about that. I said, no, you made you made the night, man. Yeah, yeah. It's a great thing when you get it right. Mm. Turn around the hecklers. That's it. It's Take a wonderful you. thing. Take yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. Right. Yeah. Don't be horrible. But like, yeah. you know, just, just hold their hand. They go, look, look, you don't really want to be saying this. Yeah. You don't really want to do this. You think you do <clears> because you've got too much alcohol in your brain. But yeah. You don't really want to say so. You're just like, oh, I want to be involved. Yeah. No, you don't. You don't. You're not ready for this yet. <laughs> your family come see you then uh, quite often? My poor wife. Puts up with it, yeah. Yeah, she's yeah, she, whole yeah, I, yeah I drag, because I, mum's on a top now, I drag mum out now and again, you know, they're very supportive, I mean, it's brilliant. I think my little man would love to come and see us. My stepdaughter, mm. the first time I met her boyfriend was at a gig mm -hmm. in Watford, Yeah, and they sat, for some reason, they sat in the front row, and I don't think at the time the audience, I was headlining, I don't think the audience realised the relationship, because Sophie had been... She'd been picked on by one of the other guys, only general sort of stuff. And so then it started to unravel that obviously this is my daughter in the audience and she's brought her boyfriend. Mm -hmm. And this is the first time <laughs> that she's met her, 
the boyfriend, she met the dad, and we're live on, on, on in the pump house, you know. Yeah. So, Matt, bless you, mummy, lovely lad, yeah. top, top lad, uh, you know, took it on the chin. Great. Right. And it was great. But it, again, it all adds to your... It adds to your thing, doesn't yeah. it? So. That's pressure. I mean, I mean, the, really, the pressure's off you. It's all on him, isn't it? Really, the pressure's on, on him. Yeah, it was. He's gonna, he's gonna be like, oh yeah, yeah, so yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you got, you've got, you got um, free reign to, to say anything to him at yeah. that moment. I bet he's just like, oh no, I'm, this is this is not how yeah. I envisioned this. But again, if you keep it friendly, keep it engaging, I think you you can get away with murder, can't you? Literally, yeah, you know, that's true. Yeah, it's fine. And you should know about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, t- I turned out a British Got Talent phone me up the other week they were obviously phoning around all the acts uh, one of the other lads had spoke to them about me they told them my kind of backstory. and so this guy was they're very you know he said oh we love the mimics on the show you know, and your yeah. backstory, you know and I said look I'll be very upfront with you I said over the years I've worked on an awful lot of very serious cases and there are people I've put you know been part of a team that put them away for a long long time mm-hmm. I said, I don't think it's fair on the victims. I don't think it's fair on the families I've worked with. I don't think it's fair on the, on the, on the suspects themselves. You know? you know, that's the reality of it. Yeah. You, you know, you can't, you have to have some sort of respect for that. Yeah. And I mean, how do you go on? Like you go, oh, like imagine the video. Oh, this is Steve Owen Williams. He's worked on all these cases. Yeah. You can't, you yeah, can't yeah, yeah, have that yeah. on the screen. Yeah. They're going, they're all just going, he was my family liaison yeah, officer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's going to be a very, yeah. a very inadequate amount of applause. They're going to be so shocked. They're going, what? Okay, great. He was a, yeah. so he was a homicide detective. Okay, and this is all the great. And here are the pictures from that. What? What do you do with that? You can't. No. It's a great. It's a wonderful backstory. It's really yeah. interesting. You can't oh, intro someone with that. Yeah, it's a tricky one because yeah. one of the one of the core roles I did was interview the suspect. So right. obviously, with with the um, you know with the communication skills and the techniques that we wow, use, amazing people. People will not forget you. You know, mm-hmm. we spend, uh, you know, depending on how long we've, we've got them for, it could be 36 hours, 72 hours sometimes. What's the longest you've set, spent with a, a suspect? We used to get like three day lay downs, so we would bring them out of prison, work with them, depending on what the, the nature of the job was. So, yeah, I mean, interview wise, you'd probably only want to talk to somebody 30 minutes, 40 minutes max mm-hmm. at, at, a, at a time. So it's very structured. You know, we've got a, obviously we've got a plan. It's a lot to do with kind of empowering the suspect to listen and, and feel part of the process. If they're going to talk to you, if, mm-hmm. if they're not going to, if, you know, if it's a no comment situation, we've got to really default back to the planning so that we make sure that we cover every kind of opportunity they might have 10 months time in the old mm-hmm. Bailey. Uh, when the barrister says, well, you know, explain what happened there. At least we've asked the question. Yeah. The fact they haven't answered it mm. doesn't really matter. It's you know it's about the thoroughness of the investigation, mm. um, and I loved all that. I, I you know I was fascinated by that. Yeah, it's, it, I mean it sounds fascinating. It's like mm. it's how to because you want to get the most information out of them, so the process can be expedient later on. There must be an awful lot of NLP in it as well, and other little tricks that you can. Like, I mean, not touch tricks, but like systems or or uh, techniques. Uh, do you know what? It, it's there... funny because people ask that. It, yeah, it, 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 it really is. It's a lot simpler than people imagine. Right. Because if you think about it, and, and you know, the way the police are often portrayed on these genders <laughs> or wherever it is. Good cut, bad cut, sort of thing. It, it's very much, it's all about them. Mm. Now, if you make it all about the person that you are interviewing mm. and you want to listen to them, to, to have the kind of respect to give them a chance to say something, actually, you know, you're drawing all that information it's clever how the dynamics work mm. if they're going to talk to you. You know, if somebody doesn't want to talk to you, they don't want to talk to you. And, and you could have every psychologist, every technique in the book, mm. you know, either from legal advice or, or they're just determined not to talk to you, they ain't going to talk to you. Mm-hmm. And they'll worry about it in, in court. And they'll wait and see what evidence comes in. Mm. You know, and, and they'll, they'll have a chance to formulate some sort of defence around that. So I, I, think, I think it was a massive, you know, it's a massive culture change for the police service in, in actually treating people properly and, and and that ability to listen is really really important mm. because again a lot of the time you find certainly in the stuff that we were doing the evidence would speak for itself but you still out of fairness you need to give people an opportunity to explain stuff mm-hmm. and that's all you're kind of doing so there was no all this uh, you know the sort of oppression stuff and things like that that's like archaic you know mm. the majority of people I certainly spoke to we let the evidence do the work. And also, you know, in terms of challenging people, yes, we, we've got duty to put, if, you know, evidence to them. But actually, the barristers take on all that at court. Mm. So as long as we've done our side of it thoroughly, mm. 
what they do next is you know that that's the cup final really and, and you've it's about not having you know if you if you've got a massive ego you're not going to be particularly great uh, interviewer because you're going to make it all about yourself mm-hmm. and not about them exactly. um, so it's an interesting dynamic it's because I mean as I say we've all sort of like been brainwashed by these cop shows as you said and yeah. all like and all those people in those cop shows are actors and it's yeah. all about them isn't it it's like yeah. you know like hey you know oh, what are you doing oh and they're like do you want a cup of coffee take the coffee away and it's like all these yeah. power games and it's so so like not like that yeah. Because as you say, you want to you want to treat them as a human being, and, and therefore go look. What happened? What's the story? What what, what yeah. happened here? And look, you know, if you if the, as I say, if they want to give that information up, yeah. you've got to treat them like they're you know like, like you're. Like, I'm just here yeah. to take the information down. If you don't want to give it to me, that's how it is. Yeah. It's like that with any interview, I guess, really, isn't it? Like, yeah, it is. You know, like with I mean, look at um, some of the great interviewers. Like you've got like. Um, Parky, isn't it? You know, you're yeah. just like you're just like all right. Look, you know, yeah. put you on tell me. You know, that's it. Yeah. Simple stuff. This paranoia that people have now. Oh, how do you how do you work the information? Other person. Oh, yeah, you these yeah. sort of NLP thing. All oh, right, you mimic their uh, or no, you don't, or you just copy their uh, their body language. Oh, yeah, you make them feel relaxed. You mirror them. Okay, fine. A, a tiny bit of that, I guess, as well, to make people feel relaxed. It's a combination of things. Mm-hmm. You know, we we uh, I mean, at the, the end of my career, I was teaching it, so yeah, we right. were teaching the specialist interview course, and we get a psychologist in on the last day, mm-hmm. and people say, "Oh, we could have done with him." Mm-hmm. right at the start you know that would have made a real difference but it, the the danger is then is that everybody would try and be that psychologist of course and and your cops you can't mm-hmm. you know that, we're working with different you know we've got different techniques different methods mm-hmm. it's useful don't get me wrong it's useful and it and it so many offenders we've interviewed it's given us an opportunity to maybe come at a different angle mm-hmm. But it's not necessarily going to solve the case for you mm-hmm. so you you've got to have all the resources kind of lined up and try and be flexible, you know. So it might be that you start off interviewing somebody and they, they don't really want to be interviewed by a lady or they don't want to be interviewed with a man. Mm. So we'd have to change the tactic around there because mm. you know, the second interviewers don't really talk at all now uh, until they get asked to talk. So it might be that we have to swap the teams over a little bit and mm. things like that. So you're continually trying to find the best options. Mm. But it, it, it is interesting how we kind of portrayed. Mm. But it's television, so you need course, yeah. you need that impact. You've got a chance to grab an audience. I, I, I suppose over the years I've got a little bit frustrated that the service doesn't come and go, actually, this is what we do and yeah. this, is, this is how we do it. You know? mm-hmm. and, and I think we've missed out on the openness and transparency a bit. Because, you know, again, you get, you're in the, constantly in the media mm. and making mistakes. That's mm. what people love. You know, they love uh, but there's actually lots of good stuff going on as well. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it's interesting when you talk to community groups and things... And you actually start to, you know, speak to them and, and explore their experiences. Some of them have had shocking experiences, mm. but some of them are actually quite supportive. So it's a real, mm. you know, real mixed bag. Uh, I guess the the techniques for when you're at home, like with uh, with the kids, and you're going. So did you? Uh... Owen where, hates it. Where were you last night? Yeah, Owen hates it. <laughs> He's like... Owen hates it. <laughs> yeah. You start off with a big open question. Yeah. You start off with a big open question. <laughs> and then we, what we go, we call up the five WHs, get a bit more detail, fine grain detail. Yeah. Yeah. And Owen will look at me and he'll, he'll do it for about two minutes. He'll go, Dad, I know what you're doing. <laughs> it's like, all right, mate. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah, it's funny. It's funny, yeah. These little techniques. The kids are great to practice on them. You know, they are... They, they are magical to, mm. to practice on. The stuff that you can extract, you know, yeah. and, and it's at the most unusual times, you know, you'll just sometimes, you you, you know, sit in the bath and I have a chat with him and he, mm. and he just pours out his whole day on the back of one question with yeah. laughs. And I love all that. It's, it's great. great. It's, it's great. great, you know. But it's in the listening. Yeah. It's massively in the listening. Mm-hmm. My, uh, my stepdad was a, uh, a policeman for 25 years and... Uh, yeah, it was like I could never get anything around around him at all. You know, it was just yeah. like okay, like the kind of the same sort of thing. You know, you just like ask you a question, like you're like, oh no, did you do this? Like, oh, well, I just have to tell the truth. I can't, I can't possibly yeah. give any false yeah. statement whatsoever. The, like the, you should really see the set you had when you were younger, and maybe yeah. the stuff you do now. And like, this is what I do now. Or was like, will that be like you give it? Yeah, away I think or? again, for me, it's getting the technology right, and uh, I think there's. I'll have a look at it, see if there's a spot. Mm. I mean, I've started to, um, I've started to combine some of the policey stuff now, some of the yeah. funnier stories yeah, you know, yeah. that you're allowed to kind of talk about now. And, uh, you know, and that's, that, I think people enjoy that. You know, mm. I did I did a, uh, some stuff for Mike Lee, again at 100 Club, mm. and uh, Mike, I, I made a decision not to speak in my own voice. 
So I did the whole set, 15 minutes, bang, 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 went through, mimic, mimic, mimic. Come off, and Mike said to me, he said, oh, mate, he said, they, he said, they wanted a bit of you, you know, mm. and I, I said, okay, all right, I'll take it on board, mate. And then the next time I did it, I started to talk about, I couldn't talk about the police, but I could talk about me, some of my life, some of my family. And again, you got a much more engaging reaction mm. off, the, uh, off the audience. So... I've just started to flirt with that since I've been, you know, I've been what retired what this now the fourth week, so mm-hmm. it's still all very surreal. Mm-hmm. Um, but I've just started to flirt with one or two little stories that mm-hmm. are, you know, again a little insight that members of the public probably wouldn't necessarily get. Very very careful around, kind of. Uh, I don't I don't want to disrespect anybody or anything like that, you know, because I. I had a fabulous career, you know, it was mm. great, it was a great career, mm-hmm. and I thoroughly enjoyed it, and saw all sorts of things, but, mm. so you have, to, there's a fine line there for me, but there was a lot of funny stuff, and you, you'll see guys like Alfie Moore, you know, Martin Bayfield, who's, who's uh, you know, does a lot of the corporates, he's got an advantage because he played rugby for England, mm. but he's also, a lot of his stories are when he was in the police. Mm-hmm. Again, it's that, it's finding that right combination, because mm. obviously when you talk, you know, the majority of my career obviously was, Murders, mass fatality. So things like the London bombings I worked heavily on, mm. a tsunami, uh, MH17, the air crash in Ukraine, you know, heavily involved in that as well. So those sort of things, there's not really going to be any humour out of mm-hmm. that. But some of the day-to-day interaction, mm. you'll find, you know, you'll, you'll find bits and pieces that are suitable to use. Do you do any stuff with, like, even that, like the cop drama so you know, the, the, the It's atypical... <laughs> Good cup of backup with like maybe McIntyre and yeah. Trump or whatever yeah. it is like this or, or you know but that that because that'd be there's a lot of there's a lot to play with and it's just it's just such an open playing field with that because no one really has done yeah. that kind of stuff have they? You know, Watch your space. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah great. So you've been going like how many years? Well, I started in uh, eighty three, nine eighty three, long time, yeah, and yeah. I've I've kind of been very lucky. You know, every time because you have to when you when you declare a business interest for the police, you you have to have it reviewed every year. Right. And uh, obviously they're they're onto you financially. Right. They're onto you material wise. You know, I had to um, I learned to do LEG, uh, and I, I got asked to do a charity do. Hmm. And and again, you for know, obviously police. for the police. Yeah, yeah. yeah for a um, it was for a lady, a uh, friend of ours that was knocked off a bike, ended up in a wheelchair, oh, and right. uh, so I asked to do do the function. And I just learned to do that in gym. Yeah. And he was he was all over the place. Sasha was like mm. smashing it on television everywhere. Yeah. And what people don't realise is that I have to go away and speak to my diversity unit and say, look, this is an interesting question for you. <laughs> <laughs> Let me run this one by. And, and uh, it took them it took them two and a half days to debate whether mm. I was allowed to do it or not. And yeah. they said, Well no, we can't see it. it's an impression of an impression mm. and providing the material is down the line, mm. we can't see that you're gonna offend anybody. Mm. Thank you very much. And the political correctness is, is, has been tricky to work with over the years. But yeah. I got booked for a St. Patrick's Night one night, and the, and the agent said, we need to do Irish material. Tell mm. Irish jokes. That's what mm. we want. You know, mm. I said, I can't. Mm. So people will be offended. Mm. You know, and it's simple as that. Mm. So, you, so it's well, if you're not going to do that, then I'm yeah. not going to book you. Fair That's enough. Fair. Okay. Yeah. You know, there's nothing I can, nothing yeah. I can do. About that. Hands are tied, don't they? Yeah. So it's been the odd occasion where where that's that's happened. I mean, it, you know, I did a gig with the Guardian. Uh, over at the Exhill Centre one year, I did some stuff about being from Wales, mm. and but I'd upset a table of Welsh people who'd been drinking quite heavily all mm. night. Mm. And what it was was they just hadn't clocked the fact that actually my family originated from Wales. Mm. So they thought I was slagging off Neath, mm. when actually from Neath. my uh, grandfather, my ancestors are all from that mm-hmm. part of the world. Mm. So because they'd had a few beers, they'd missed the listening. Mm. I mean, the Guardian of the... Uh, the Guardian were flapping like that. They said, oh, we can't go back on. I was emceeing this sort of charity group. Can't go back on, can't we? Mm-hmm. I said, look, let me apologise. I said, don't underestimate the power of apology. Mm-hmm. And all right, we'll send a bottle of wine. And it was fine. Mm-hmm. Absolutely fine. You get kind of wary of that sort of stuff. Yeah, you yeah. know, you, you tread carefully. So, I mean, I've enjoyed uh, a little bit more freedom now in the last three weeks. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't go mad. I'm not too OTT. It means that I can have gentle road rage now. Yeah. Stuff like that. <laughs> Whereas before, I've never been able to do that. You know. totally. I've been cut up by so many people and I've gone, that's okay, fine. Yeah. Don't worry about it. Broken saw me steering oh. wheels. <laughs> oh. I'm thinking about buying a white van to yeah. compete a bit more. So, uh, just to fit in. So, yeah, so it, it's taken a lot of pressure off yeah. that. So, I'm just I'm just at that process where I need to get more organised, rehearse a lot more, practice a lot more, set down yeah. I've got some very good 
friends, you know, we're very lucky in this business because we're all pretty well supported, you know, and I, I, I worked with Jeff Stevenson the other week, who is just a, a lovely, lovely man, and he's a great kind of mentor, you know, mm. Lewis is, is, is brilliant, Alex, they're all, mm. we're very lucky that we're surrounded by some very decent people mm. who are successful at what they do really well, mm. and so as a kind of amateur sort of stepping in and out, it's been it, it's been good, you know. Mm. I've been very grateful for that sort of stuff. Mm. Obviously, it relies on you being funny, doesn't it? That's, it's that's true. the bottom line. That, that's true. I think, I think funny is, is definitely the, a big part of it. Yeah. But the second <laughs> part is equally important. I was talking to someone last night. I said, like, you know, you know, it's like you got to be careful, don't you? Because you got to be like, not that you're trying to force a, a, a amicable demeanor, but hopefully you are that anyway. Remember your face. Go, say hello to people. <laughs> Yeah. Don't be a dick. Yeah. Like, don't, forget, don't forget your manners, isn't it? You go, oh, yeah. right, I was going, or I'm going to do this bit in a second. Because otherwise they'll think, God, this person's a right dick. Because yeah. want, you, want you, you want to be around these, you want the people to want to be around you as well as you yeah. know, be funny up on stage. Because yeah. otherwise you're like, well, this person, okay, they might be funny, but I don't really want to work with them because they've got no personality yeah. and I can't sit in a car for four hours with them to go to this thing. Because yeah. that's going to do my head in. Yeah. And, I just, you know, they better be the shit. They better be the top notch and yeah, the funniest yeah, person yeah. I've ever met or the nicest person, but yet they're still funny. Yeah. You know, no, I mean, the whole thing fascinates me. The whole yeah. line of the tennis fascinates yeah. me. And, yeah. I, and I think I've survived this long. Yeah. I've, I've kept my foot in the door since, what, 1983. And there's a mimic. Yeah. I think, again, you've got to move with the times. Mm. So if you can still kind of hold your own now, mm. a, you, you must have something. But also, I think, it, you know, again, I just have good fun. Yeah. It's just great fun. And I think meeting different people all the time, the majority of comedians I've worked with and met mm. have been a good laugh. Mm. You're on and off stage, mm. you know, and I, I've got massive respect for everybody that gets out there and, and, and has a go, you know. Mm. And I think, again, if mates of mine will say, well, how do we, you know, I'm thinking about this. And it is a massive step up. It's a step up from being funny generally mm. to actually standing out there. And, and I love the fact that when I... PG uh, from Having a Laugh gave me a few chances doing a bits and pieces um, when I was starting to really pick up a little bit of momentum. And I love the fact that there were so many people just starting it as a hobby. Mm. Yeah, and, and yet, you know, the market is massively saturated. But do you know what? You know, if you've got the talent, you, you deserve to be, you know, people work so hard. Mm. And, that, and again, I, I say that in my, uh, you know, as a mimic, I just mess around. Mm. I'm terribly conscious that I just mess around. And I see people really, really grafting, mm. but I see people moving on, you know. Mm. And that, that's a lovely thing as mm. well, is that I'm no expert at this. I've just been around a long time and um, seen a lot of things. Mm. And, and I'm looking forward to working hard at it mm. now. Mm. But to see people progress, I think, in our business mm. is wonderful. Uh, yeah. do you, did you do shift work up until you quit? Uh, the last few years I was teaching, so I, I taught... Um, uh, homicide family liaison so when we work with bereaved families uh, mm. at their kind of toughest times uh, teach the guys how to do that mm. I taught something called disaster victim identification so okay. there's an anti-mortem side and a post-mortem side so mm. we teach the guys uh, to do all the mortuary stuff and it's all about identification so mm. I taught that as well and obviously the interviewing specialist interviewing course so for the last few years I've done pretty much a kind of eight or four sort of situation which was a nice Kind of nice way to finish off, really. But before that, certainly at Harrow, it was shifts and, and the murder team was, you know, you react to what you're doing, really. So you could have some very, you know, you'd have some very, very long days. Mm. Very, very long days. Mm. That helps with this as well when you're driving God knows how many hours to wherever it is. That ah, it's fine. Just get yeah. drive there. This is, I've got this just done, you know. That's yeah. No problem at all. I think sometimes when you when you've done a gig as well, that, that adrenaline, mm. I find it really difficult to calm down afterwards because mm-hmm. I get so nervous before mm. and then afterwards, if it's gone, you know, whether it's, if it's not gone so well, mm. I'm kind of, you spend like that process debriefing everything mm. in your head, you know, mm. and, and if it's gone well, you like, you mm. can't sleep. Mm-mm. So that three or four hour drive back from somewhere, <laughs> actually, you know, my ever sister, she said, well, you should get a hotel or something, but, I said, no, no, it's all right, before because you're like this, yeah. you know. So, yeah, 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 yeah. It. so it's funny. Yeah. But I love, it. I, I love all that, you yeah. know, that's, that's all part of it for me. Mm. So what's the next mission then? Are you learning the technology? The next mission is, yeah, I've got to get a bit more switched on. Stu Turner, who we work with, she's, she's fantastic on the yeah. tech side. So he's, you know, I'm constantly looking looking for advice off around it. Yeah. And I'll get there, I'll get there, he's great. For me, it's about putting some structure back in mm-hmm. to stuff to polishing stuff off 
really, to be able to deliver two or three different sets, mm. combine the voices properly, get it much smoother. I mean, I, I say, it, there's, there's a side of me that I call it as I see it sometimes as well, and I think that puts a different edge to you know, your stand-up mm-hmm. thing, that sometimes you just have to react to what's going on. And, and it, it, But it's create, trying to create as many options for me uh, when I'm actually delivering the stuff. Mm. I, it needs practice. Mm-hmm. You know, it needs practice. Mm-hmm. So... There's lots of lots of voices I'd like to do. It's about hitting hitting the right voices and the combinations, and that's going to take a little bit of time. But uh, you know, like I say, we've we've survived so far, and just seeing because obviously with the professional with the police stuff, the people are asking me to do some bits and pieces like lecturing and things like yeah. that. So I'll, I'll do that. I think we'll, you know I'll set up a company over the next week or so and combine education and entertainment mm. uh, and, and do something like that. I just try and keep enjoying myself. You know, mm. I, I've been very, very lucky, like I say, to work with some incredible people. Mm. You know, uh, to stand alongside guys like Bobby Davro, Jeff, you know, Mike Reed when he was alive, yeah. you know, and, and some of the sports players, you know, guys that I've worked alongside. It's been, you know, I worked with Graham Taylor, who, you know, when he died, I thought, do you know what? You were a lovely man and that mm. was a great gig. And you, you kind of remember those mm. things. And we, we did a, a Watford Supporters Trust gig together. And there was 200 people in, in a sports club in, in uh, Watford, all diehard Watford fans. And he was just, he, he said to me, he said, oh, I'll just do 10 minutes, son, 10 mm. minutes. He went, an uh, hour and 10 minutes later, he was still, <laughs> to, and they just loved him, they yeah. loved him. But we did, uh, I had to do an auction, mm. uh, and we just, we, we auctioned off, the, the prizes were just ridiculous. Like the, the, there was a Watford football pennant. So and I'm looking at the organiser, I said, well, what do you want? I'll start the bidding at Fiverr. Fiverr? The silent. <laughs> like nobody, you know. Fiverr? I said, I'll tell you what, there's a Watford mug there. Let's put it together with the mugs. We've got a Watford <laughs> yeah. mug and a Watford pennant. Come on, five pounds. You know, silence. Silence. So Graham's laughing. Mm-hmm. Oh, people are starting to giggle. Mm-hmm. I said, Graham, come here a minute. Sign these. Sign these. Yeah. So he signed. Pennant. Football pennant. Mug. Signed by Graham Taylor. <laughs> Watford legend, you know. Yeah. I started bidding at hundred pounds. Bang, bang, bang. Yeah. Off it went. Yeah. So it was great. So there, there were some classic moments. Mm. Improving with stuff around you. So is that how you keep it? Because you can do like an, an hour at least at this stage, can you? Probably forty-five minutes. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I mean, like to keep it because you're mimicking your voices and things like that. Yeah. So to keep it alive and and and, and buoyant. You've got to like just got you know you you just react and and, and yeah, just so, respond. So, yeah, certainly when you're auctioning, um, mm-hmm. you know I've done some big gigs where you have six or seven hundred people in the room, and yeah. I again my eyesight's not brilliant. I always forget my glasses, right. and I'm relying on like the support team yeah. with paddles and God knows what. People on the tables have had a drink; they don't play by the rules, so they just you know it's all like this. Yeah. So you you have to keep that spontaneous, and mm-hmm. and you know I've like, watched I've watched. Um, a few of the auctioneers, you know, pro auctioneers, mm. the atmosphere they create, and it's all to do with speed mm-hmm. and, and listening and vision, and mm-hmm. you know, so you try and combine that. You know, again, I'm no expert, but you know, there's pressure on me to make yeah. money for the charity. Cool. So yeah, you get the chance then to throw in bits and pieces, mm-hmm. and then what you're doing then is you're you're trying to create bidding wars between tables yeah, and all right. that. So it's all good fun. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, I mean, it's chaos. Yeah, yeah, so it's you're chaos. the catalyst for the banter to yeah. happen. You're, you're basically the man that wants to f- to follow or be the raffle, aren't you really? I mean, like in that situation, in the auctions and stuff. Yeah, I mean, because not every comedian's like, like, oh crap, I've got to follow a fucking raffle. Yeah. Because then, because yeah. if, if you're, the person that doesn't do well at the raffle, yeah. they dr- sap all of the joy out of that room because they're like, oh, we don't fucking, you know, they're like, oh jeez, we want to just, well, the raffle is at the end of the night. If the raffle's put in the middle, yeah. it's just like, what the hell? What the hell are you doing? They're like the yeah. raffles at the end. That's in everyone's head. Well, yeah, we should yeah. be going home after this raffle. We've got our prize. Why the fuck are we still here? But okay, right now that is not a question. <laughs> you just don't like raffles. I just don't like raffles. I'm not a fan of raffles. I'm not a fan yeah, of raffles. Yeah. Just gonna say this has happened to me before. Uh, you're a little bit bitter there. Uh, yeah, you haven't won one, have you? Did you know that? Did you know that? <laughs> Oh, it's all coming back to me now. Oh, that's it. Yeah, I mean, I I, I get asked to do uh, to arrange bits and pieces mm. in certain nights, and one of the things I always say to people, let's just have if you're going to auction, let's have just four items, yeah. and then if we're going to raffle, let's have six or seven nice prizes. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I've done raffles where there's been forty, fifty prizes. Yeah, and wow. and, and it, you've 
it, it's often, you know, it, it just, it's comedy in itself, mm. but it just kills, it does kill at kill night. Yeah. And uh, so it's, it's, it's tricky because, again, with those, I've done gigs where people people bring raffle prizes there. Yeah. So mm. even the organisers don't know. Uh, and you, what do you do? You can't turn yeah. people away. You think, thank you, it's for a charity. That's great. So you, you kind of have to try and work around yeah, that a little keep, bit but um, keep it keep it fun try and keep it, uh, the, oh, keep it buoyant yeah. as I say but it's like yeah. what's the worst option what's the the worst price you've kind of gone oh come on the Watford one is pretty up high up on there right yeah. the Watford thing and then you sign, then yeah. Graham signed it uh, you're like oh what is it? what are the options it, it, funny enough it was it was on the same gig yeah and it was a uh, it was a goalkeeper's glove right, right? <laughs> just one of them one goalkeeper's glove <laughs> <laughs> and it was uh, and it was signed by the Watford goalkeeper at the time a guy called Steve Sherwood but this glove would have fitted my son yeah. so it was a tiny little goalkeeper's glove he just got his signature on it yeah. and it wasn't in a frame or anything it, and, it, and I, I couldn't even put it on couldn't yeah. even put it on and one of the girls that was doing walking around with the auction items she said it like that like just between two fingers and <laughs> so we just oh, and, I, and I'm looking at Graham Taylor going what do I do? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Generally, I mean, a lot of the stuff I've done, they get some incredible prizes. Yeah. Incredible prizes. Yeah. You know, but you are, I did a load of stuff with the Spine Injury Association and, yeah. and they, they want a top 40 grand, you know, out of their auction. So there's, yeah. there's a lot of pressure on you yeah. to, to get, get, get that, but they are incredible prizes. Yeah. You know, and I, it's funny when I go to them sometimes, cause I used to phone my dad up and I said, dad, do you want to put a bid in for something? So I said, there's a, you know, there's a British Lions shirt here, Dad, you mm. know, and all this sort of stuff. And we sat, I sat at one of um, Lois Delalio's benefits. I said to Dad, there was, um, I think there was a side England shirt coming out. And I said, what do you want to go up to, Dad? And he said, oh, about a grand for that. He said, whatever. Mm. Yeah. So Geoffrey Archer was doing the auction. Yeah. It was a signed the, the, World Cup. The, the, the author? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. It was a signed, uh, I think, he'd not, not one come out of prison, I don't think, Geoffrey, so he needed the work. Um, <laughs> and he... And he, and he um, <laughs> He started the bidding off, yeah. and, it, and the girls were going around with the thing. And he said, "Right, this is a World Cup, World Cup winning England shirt in a frame." Da da da. I'm going to start the bidding off. Seven thousand pounds. Oh no! Got <laughs> it. Just like, boom. Yeah, sorry. I mean, guys. it's amazing. I mean, yeah. I, it's just a different league, yeah, different yeah, league. You know. That's it. So I phoned that up. I said, "No, we, we're not going to yeah. compete with that." Damn, you know? That's it. it it's crazy. Yeah, my day. But they're funny dudes. Yeah, I'll bet. And so are you, um, are you going to be doing the Fringe this year as well, or next year? Is that um, no, I'm not going to do the Fringe this year. I'm going to potter away. Uh, there's some projects I want to do at home. I think we're going to go away as well uh, over there. I'm going to, I'd look to do the Fringe at some stage. Mm. Uh, again, it's just been time, you know, it's just not having the time to do it. Mm. I think I'd, I'd approach it with an open mind. I see some of my dear friends go up there and come back devastated. Mm. So I, I, I think I'll just treat it as a, as a sort of fun thing mm. again I mean I'm, I'm one of those I enjoy it I love, I love what we do and I love I love the comedy but I've got no desire to be on television or live at the Apollo or anything mm. like that just want to make people laugh and, and give people a good night you know we've done I did um, Lovely Night Sunday the anti-poet guys you know fantastic mm. uh, Lovely Night in St Albans at the Fighting Cox Saturday you know VIP sort of guys we've got some got some of our regular guys in there and, and it I just want to make people have a good night you know that's that's what it's all about it's about delivering a service mm. people want it you want them to walk out that door and go those guys were good weren't they mm-hmm. that's what it's about I see a few gigs that are kind of taking the mickey out the comedians a little bit and mm. I, I, I'm kind of wary of that mm. you know I, I think sometimes we go to places and we're not particularly well treated mm. you know that disappoints me so I think anything I try and run Try and you know look after the the acts as as, as well as we can really mm-hmm. because at the end of the day they the combination of the audience and 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 the acts are that's the VIP thing isn't it mm-hmm. you know and if you keep the acts happy they'll keep the audience happy mm-hmm. so it's 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 that sort of compromise so you know people say to me, oh you arrange this gig arrange that I get asked to do gigs mm-hmm. but really I'm not to concentrate on being a mimic that's what mm-hmm. I like to do. because again organising the stuff comes with a different pressure doesn't yeah, it? it does and it, it does. and it, it really is. You know, we've got plenty of promoters. Let the promoters promote. Let, mm-hmm. let, them, let them do that. They do it well. And, uh, you know, for me, I've got an archaic PA system. Stuart mm. laughs at me when I turn up that thing. I mean, it's great. <laughs> it, but to try and get it, you know, you crank it up. Yeah. It, it weighs a ton. I'm getting old, you mm. know, so the arthritis is kicking in. Right, yeah. You know, I've got to get something smaller. But I enjoy people 
having a good night. Yeah. You know, so that that's important. Let the players play, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and yeah the definitely. Promote. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I wish definitely. I had a better ring to it. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely, definitely. I, I think you know it's just about being fair with everybody, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, uh, it's true. So, Again, you know, you have to you have to be realistic. I and mean, my family, keep, you know, I keep my feet on the ground mm. with the stuff that we've we've done in the day job and things. So I'm very realistic. I mean, I, you know, you certainly change your perspective of life, you know, and you you realise how precious life is and things mm. like that. So it's about making the most of your opportunities, definitely, and and enjoying yourself. I think, but it, it, you know, I'm conscious. I do need to up the game a bit, just get a little bit more organised, yeah. so that when people ask me for a video link, I can actually just go, Shoo. yeah. And off it goes. Mm-hmm. Send it, you yeah. know. Rather than trying to, uh, I what was I doing the other day? I was, I was, uh, I had my video link yeah. on the computer, and I'm videoing it on my phone, and then trying to send it. Oh, right. Yeah, so yeah. that's the sort of stage I'm at at the moment. You know, yeah. very Janet and John Mm-mm. sort of technology. Yeah. But I'm, I'm going to get there. Well, you know, we'll see if you get any prompts. I'll give you a hand, man. If you want, I'll show you how to do some stuff if you want, man. I need proper tuition. That's all right, man. That's all right. Yeah, yeah. I need to be in this cave regularly yeah. with you. Yeah, you're not down, you're not far anywhere, are you? Like we could, I could bring the wife over. The girls could yeah, drink. Yeah, that's fine. And, yeah, I'll show you how to do it. You can show me how to do it. Yeah, I'd like that. Cool. Yeah, because <laughs> behind the game, mate. <laughs> <laughs> mate, I, I'm, I'm just trying to catch up myself. I'm just yeah. jog, I'm jogging. And I can see the car is a few miles ahead of me. I'm sure yeah. he's trying to get to it. I think I think Stuart Turner's in ignoring my calls now. He now? <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's tech support. <laughs> he's like my helpline. Oh, yeah. That's it. Yeah. Oh, no. Brilliant. Well, he's going to shoot as soon as he be on a 1-800 number, you know? That's yeah. It. Oh, dear. Yeah. But, um, well, not, not, I don't know if that quite kind of number he wants to be on. But anyway. Oh, wait, no, <laughs> Tell your age now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, everywhere I'm showing my age at this stage, Steve. I say, it. but um, yeah, you do you plan to get an agent or anything? You're just going to see, going to. Just... I think I think it's more whether they like me. Yeah, right. um, I, I, yeah. Again, uh, I, I've done some bits. Uh, I do some bits with Mike Lee. Yeah, uh, who, again, lovely guy. You mm-hmm. know, and yeah, I said to Mike, you know, if there's opportunities, oh, he's a talent agent. I mean, he's oh, an MLA, MLA talent, so he looks after Lewis and, and Alex, uh, mm-hmm. and loads of other acts. You mm-hmm. know, uh, and he's just a he's just a decent guy. You know, yeah. so with a Mike. We'll take this on. I don't know uh, whether yeah. somebody else comes forward. I don't know. And again, yeah. I, you, you know, you're only as good as your last gig. Isn't it? So, if you, I think, it, if I can work on the consistency, you know, and, and pick off a few gigs here and there, then things will tick over. I just got to get more organised mm. and 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 right. You know, right. I'd like to. Got lots of ideas. You know, different combinations of uh, voices. Something. Morgan Freeman, Trump, and Boris mm. will be in the same situation mm-hmm. very soon. Cool. Very soon, it will be out there for public consumption. We'll see how it goes. The Mock the Week stuff, yeah. again, it rides okay, but I've been doing it a while now, so we need to juggle that around. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd, I'd like to bring back, you know, I think the nice thing is with the mimics is that you can look at an audience, you think, right, I've got mm-hmm. an 18 year old there, I've got a 25 year old there, I've got an 80 year old over there. Mm-hmm. So you can hit quite a broad range, mm-hmm. hopefully, if you get that combination right. Mm-hmm. There's something for everybody, yeah, yeah. and then fill it in with bits of observational stand-up as well. Mm. So I talk about I talk about my son, you know, going to football, and and, mm. and you know, just some of the conversations that the kids have are priceless. Mm. I talk about Mrs. Williams, poor old Mrs. Williams gets mm. some stick. Mm. My mum, mm. you know, and and so uh, I suppose at times it's a little bit John Bishop esque, but there are you know funny things, and you mm. combine that with my former career. Mm. You know, it might be attractive, it might not be, I don't know. Mm. I don't know if I'm... Uh, there's a lot to be said for working in B&Q for three or four days. Mm. So really? I, might, <laughs> I, might, I might do that. Yeah. But, yeah, you know, I mean, it's like this week, uh, you know, I was struggling with a cold. And again, that's like, for a mimic, that's like mm. Wayne Rooney losing a foot for yeah, playing football, yeah. you know, it's a, it's a terrible thing. So, again, I'm very conscious, like, I need to get healthy, you need to keep, you know, look after your voice a mm. bit. A year ago, I had some real problems health-wise with... Kind of acid reflux and stuff like that, and so it was burning the vocal cords. Mm. I ended up having speech therapy and being like coached around what what we do. And when the woman assessed me, she said, "What do you do now for a day job?" So I said, well, "I'm teaching, so I'm talking six hours." Okay, uh, what else do you do? I said, "Well, I'm a I'm a mimic. I'm an impressionist." She went, "What?" Mm. I said, "I do impressions of people." So I said, "You know, I could be Alan Carr, got one, then I'm mm. up to." Sean Dice at Burnley or so the, again the range is all over the place 
all right. I said, and then Sunday morning, I coach under 11s at rugby, so I scream at the kids. <laughs> yeah. So in terms of using your voice, I was mm. off the scale. So I've had to kind of think about that yeah. and start really, really looking after it. Yes, and, it. And, be, and we all kind of, all the mimics mm. get, get, you know, Lewis had, uh, you know, he said, we've all had cameras down our throats. Oh, yeah. Things like that. Because it is, it is you, you're trying to do things with your voice that mm. it doesn't necessarily want to do. You know, I'm husky now because I'm mm. on the back of a two gigs and a, and a cold. So. Yeah. I seem to talk like David Essex all the time, you know. Because um, you're mashing your vocal cords together. Absolutely. And you can get nodes on them, can't you? Yeah, 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 yeah. Really, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're very switched on to that. Right, um, yeah. And so what do you do? do you, what's your preparation? Do you put like some glycerin? Is it glycerin? Uh, salt, uh, salt water. Salt water. Salt water. Salt water. Right. Um, mm. Exercise. Oh, yeah. Different. Uh, they taught us how to breathe, um, change the reverse me breathing or whatever. Okay. So there's loads of little exercises that I should be doing. Um right. But you know the bottom line is is voice rest, drink plenty of water. Mm. You know if you want if you want to do the things you want to try and do with your voice mm. and, and bend it all around the place, yeah. um, which obviously I'm going to look to do that a bit more now. Yeah. yeah, if you haven't got the main tool working properly, yeah, you're knackered. Yeah, exactly. You're knackered. Yeah, so, um, yeah. That's the main instrument. You're going to yeah. destroy it. Is that you don't yeah. be very careful. You're going to treat it well. Yeah. We can find you on Twitter. You can find, find me on Facebook. Facebook. Steve Allen Williams. You can find me on Twitter, uh, MC Mimic. At the moment, I haven't got a website yet, but that's that's going to be uh, coming in the in the next few weeks. Great. I just discovered how to share kind of some of these ticket websites as well. So Stu and I and uh, Phil Reed, Bethany, Revan and Fennel, mm. and Double Act, uh, Alice and uh, Rosie. Uh, we're doing like a little variety mm. tour. So Stu's knocked that all together. So we're in... Bath, Southampton, Birmingham, um, Sunbury, Windsor. So Stu's got us all these little mm. bits and pieces. That, so that's going to be good fun. Mm. I'm doing some bits with Yellow Comedy, Andy uh, mm-hmm. Carbs over there, great guy. Um, mm-hmm. He's put, put comedy back into kind of Hertfordshire. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's great. Bits and pieces, really. Mm. You know, I've got a few a few corporate gigs lined up, a few golf bits and pieces that, that you know, always good fun. They're mm. nice gigs to do. Mm. Um, so it, it ticks along, you know, mm. to a manageable level. But yes, I am definitely available for hire now. Great. Well, Steve <laughs> Owen Williams, thanks for coming on the Comedy Defects. I really enjoyed it. lovely that. winter. Lovely. Thanks, Thank man. you very much. Awesome. Cheers, buddy. And that was episode 36 with Stephen Owen Williams, Comedy Mimic. Really lovely guy. Go like his page. Go find him on Facebook, Twitter, all those places. Go see him live. Go talk to him. He's a lovely guy. He's always got time for people. Yeah, that was episode 36. If you like this podcast, you can follow us on Twitter. We're there at The Comedy Defect. You can follow me at Winter Phone Under. I've got some previews for my Fringe show coming up and they are available on my website which I'm getting redone very soon and they'll be on there at winterphonander.com The dates for my previews will be again on my website which is winterphonander.com So find them there and come see me work some stuff out some great stuff coming the show is nearly in shape some sort of semblance of a shape of a show I'm really excited about it it's going to be really a lot of fun to do yeah, the poster's done. You'll see that soon. It's on Facebook. But yeah, so so yeah, so I, I'd say I'm really enjoying it at the moment. I'm, I'm just trying to do as many projects as I can at the moment. I'm, I've started up a new project, which is called the Bunkai Bunker. I don't know if you heard the intro, but it's the Bunkai Bunker. Yes, that is what I'm doing with a friend of mine called Phil Alcott. I've been trying to get Phil in a room for ages to do something with him because he is a great friend of mine and we have just such great chemistry together. It's really good fun. So I'm looking forward to messing about with that kind of stuff and we're going to do some more stuff. I say, look, who needs sleep? You can also check out the Guinness Encyclopedic Jokes, which I'm writing at the moment. I'm getting through it, man. I'm on page 50 now. I'm doing all right. There's 700 pages, but that's quite a fair bit into it. I'm quite impressed with myself. So go find those Encyclopedic Jokes on Twitter, at Guinness Jokes. Like them, share them, enjoy them. It's a bit of fun. If you want to donate to the podcast, you can. We're on Patreon. Go to Patreon, type in The Comedy Defect Podcast, and we're there. Donate, if you can. If you can't, share your favourite episode, you know, or leave us a nice, honest review. And those of you that do donate, thank you very much for donating. It pays for the people that can't. Tell your friends about the podcast because it tells people where we are and what we're doing. Join the Facebook group, which is The Comedy Defect Podcast Facebook group. It's easy. 
join it and you'll find out all of the stuff that's going on. That's it for this episode of the Comedy Defect Podcast. We'll see you next week for episode 37 with Rob Kemp. <laughs>